In continuing NF Awareness Month, I wanted to discuss how a plexiform neurofibroma is removed for those of you with neurofibromatosis. But before we jump in, make sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that thumbs up and bell icon to continue getting the most current information and honest commentary on the latest procedures in trans in plastic surgery. My name is Dr. Andre Panosian, and I am a board certified plastic surgeon specializing in neurofibromatosis, facial paralysis reconstruction, and cosmetic surgery. My goal for this channel is to provide you with up to date information on all aspects of plastic surgery so that you are always well informed. Previously, we discussed when to seek surgical intervention for neurofibromatosis. I will leave that link in the description in case you haven't watched that video. Plexiform neurofibromas are large, diffuse masses that can pose significant challenges to reconstruction. Their name is derived from the fact that these tumors exhibit different patterns and cell types related to nerve sheaths, which are the outer lining cells of peripheral nerves. These tumors usually have no definite border and behave differently than the smaller segmental tumors, which are more isolated and well-defined. On the surface, plexiform neurofibromas usually have noticeable hyperpigmentation or darkening of the skin, similar to a large birthmark. Sometimes these areas will also have coarse hair growing over them. Internally, plexiform neurofibromas have a variety of appearances from fleshy and solid to gray and gelatinous. There's usually no definitive boundary to these tumors, as I mentioned before, which often means that we inevitably leave some tumor behind whenever we try to remove them. So what's the strategy for removal if we can't get rid of these tumors completely. In surgery, we always have to determine and distinguish if something is benign or malignant. That will then dictate the aggressiveness of the approach in conjunction with the symptoms these tumors are causing. In other words, we go after malignant tumors more aggressively than benign tumors. Of course, removing any tumor, benign or malignant, should also aim to treat the symptoms they create. So what are those symptoms? Let's break them down. Number one, regional pain, which can present as anything from aching to pins and needles to shock-like sensations can occur. More persistent and severe Severe pain may indicate an underlying malignancy though, but it's still very rare. Number two, itching is also a troubling symptom related to these large tumors. This is because neurofibromas in general often release histamine from something called mast cells. Histamine release can create itching similar to an allergic reaction. However, it's not related to how allergies are triggered. Number three, anatomic distortion is one of the difficult features to treat with plexiform neurofibromas. Those that occur on the face can be quite large and can have an impact on the underlying bone and soft tissue issues. Many tumors that occur on the face can also distort the normal location of nearby structures, such as the position of the ear or corner of the eye or mouth. Number four, secondary problems can also be present, especially when you have a larger tumor. This can include bony changes in the spine due to a lopsided heavy weight on one side of the body, a pelvic tilt, bowing of bones, especially in the legs or arms, and stiffness of fingers and hands. Plexiform neurofibromas that occur internally can also press on internal organs or structures, such as the airway or bladder. So what does this all mean for large plexiform neurofibromas? Well, to answer this question, we need to set an achievable goal for treatment. It's important to note that surgery is not always an option for plexiform neurofibromas. There are tumors that we consider inoperable if they occur in areas where removal can be dangerous, such as behind the sternum or inside the chest or around the airway or along the floor of the pelvis. Instead, medical or non-surgical therapy is preferred. This can be in the form of radiation therapy or even chemotherapy. Therapy. There have been promising results from the use of MEK inhibitors recently in trying to keep the tumor small or to possibly shrink them. However, surgery still remains the best option for most plexiform neurofibromas whenever possible. So why are plexiform neurofibromas so difficult to treat? There are three major reasons for this. Number one, they can distort normal anatomy, creating a real reconstructive challenge. Number two, they can bleed profusely during surgery. And number three, they have poor circulation. Let's take these separately. Many plexiform neurofibromas present as very large masses that occupy and distort anatomy. For example, tumors on the face can displace the ear or eye. They can also extend into dangerous areas such as the large neck blood vessels. They can also sit on top of vital nerves over the extremity. These tumors can soften the overlying skin anchoring ligaments to create significant laxity or drooping effect. They can also infiltrate and displace muscle and fat while producing bone abnormalities. The removal process must be simultaneously planned with the reconstruction that will be needed. 
This means that pre-op planning is essential whenever these tumors are tackled. Questions such as how much tumor can be removed safely, what suspension procedures will be needed, what critical nerves should be avoided, and where to place incisions must all be answered before entering the operating room. In addition, plexiform nerve fibromas can bleed profusely. This is believed to be related to a large amount of histamine release when cutting into them. Histamine tends to block the action of platelets, which are involved in clotting. Depending upon the size and extent of the tumor, a possible blood transfusion may even be required at the time of surgery. Many surgeons unfamiliar with plexiform neurofibromas are often taken aback by how much bleeding occurs at the outset of the surgery and are then forced to prematurely abort the surgery. Finally, as vascular as these tumors may seem at the time of surgery, their circulation is actually quite poor and disorganized. Care must be taken to avoid too much tension on the skin when closing the wound. Frequently, some amount of skin loss can be seen afterwards if a surgeon is unaware of this issue. This can lead to a secondary problem that will need to be managed. Over the years, I have developed an approach to these large and difficult tumors to minimize blood loss, improve recovery, and limit postoperative complications. I always want to know what is the most obvious problem related to the tumor. Is it the distortion of normal anatomy, or is it the sheer weight of the mass, or both? For example, a plexiform neurofibroma on the face that distorts the eye or the ear will be the most obvious goals for correction. I always like to think what draws the eye. Often it is not so much the mass itself, but what it distorts anatomically or if it's creating asymmetry. In these situations, I want to reposition the ear into a more symmetric configuration. I also want to restore finer details such as eyelid or eyebrow positions, also to restore the jawline or distortions in the hairline, which can also draw the eye. As a different example, a massive plexiform neurofibroma of the leg or trunk may create an imbalance of the spine or interfere with walking. The goal in this case is to reduce size more than it is to restore anatomy. When it comes to bleeding, it is important to be prepared for the worst. Rehearsing the surgery prior to the operative day is essential in anticipating problems that might arise. Moving quickly through the steps of surgery is also important in order to avoid losing too much blood. Often stopping to cauterize bleeding vessels is ineffective when treating plexiform neurofibromas because of the poor clotting ability, as described earlier. Instead, compression techniques are useful when a pause is necessary during surgery. However, bleeding can also occur after surgery is completed. In these situations, this might require a trip back to the operating room to stop the bleeding and to evacuate a hematoma. Over the years, I have transitioned from using drains for this purpose to a technique of closing the underlying tissues with stitches. This effectively closes off the dead space created when the bulk of the tumor is removed, thereby preventing blood from accumulating in that space. Avoidance of a drain is not always possible, but it's great for patient comfort, whenever we don't need to use one. Finally, we need to be able to reliably close the resulting wound when a plexiform neurofibroma is removed. This means that the initial placement of the incisions is crucial in terms of preserving vascularity of the skin as much as it is for concealing the scars whenever possible. In addition, closing skin should never be under tension so that the incisions heal without separating or creating an open wound. Sometimes removing a plexiform neurofibroma may require more than one surgery. We call this staged excision. This is done in order to avoid some of the issues we already discussed, such as excessive bleeding or straining the vascular supply of the overlying skin. For very large plexiform neurofibromas, this is my preferred approach to not only avoid post-operative complications, but to get predictable, excellent results and to preserve patient safety. Well, that about wraps up this installment of Inside Plastic Surgery. If you have a plastic surgery topic you would like for me to talk about, put it in the comments below. And in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe and hit that thumbs up and bell icon to continue getting the most current information and honest commentary on the latest procedures and trends in plastic surgery. See you next time.